Um, so the gathering process, um, and we're just gonna write steps down for doing this margin of error. So the gathering process is basically, um, you'll need X, the number of successes, Uh, you're going to need n, which is the sample size. Um, you may as well compute p hat, which remember is the number of successes divided by your sample size. So that's called a sample proportion. I'll go write it down here. That's your sample proportion. But they'll also give you a level of confidence. I think that's all you need. Um, while we're at it, let's remind ourselves that um, that you'll need this alpha value. So, so also um, alpha is one minus the level of confidence. Okay, so don't forget about that. Now, there's also a check that you have to do. So let me see here. I'm going to show you, first of all, I'm going to write some more stuff down that I'm going to erase. So don't bother writing this down. The, the check um, should be that um, n, oops, that np is at least 10 and that nq is at least 10. You're not going to be able to check those because um, the population proportion is required for that. And the population proportion is unknown. We are going to be estimating it. All right. We use p hat as the estimate for p. And we compute a margin of error in that estimate. But p, the population proportion, is unknown. And that's why we're estimating it. So the, it, it could be the president's approval rating. Nobody knows what that is because nobody's asked every voter except on election day. So until election day, all the numbers you see are, are P hat, they're estimates, okay? And they all have a margin for error. And so we have to compute those. Now, we, in general, when we do this, we um, need to verify normality is legitimate and it requires P. You don't know what P is. So we have to use P hat, okay? Now, that's fine, and q hat will be one minus p hat. But just to let you know here, um, let me let me move this out of the way. So I want to make a note here: um, p hat p is unknown. So um, we'll use p hat. Okay, but it's actually a lot simpler, simpler than it looks. Um, and maybe you were already thinking the thought. Um, n times p hat, remember p hat was x over n, the number of successes divided by the number of trials. So n p hat is n times x over n. And of course, <laughs> the n's cancel. So, that's just x, which is the number of successes. Okay. And then n times q hat is um, n times one minus p hat, which is n times one minus x over n. <laughs> Oops, sorry. That should be a one n sign. P q hat is one minus x over n. Now, if you do the math here, this is just n minus x. 
So if you take the number of trials, that's n, and you subtract the number of successes, that those are x, then you get n minus x, which would have to be the number of failures. Okay. Take the number of trials, subtract the number of successes, and you get the number of fails. Okay. So um, this is just a little scratch work over here. So the check is just um, at least 10 successes, right? So the number of successes has to be at least 10. So we need at least 10 of those. and at least 10 failures. Okay, so you always have to do that when you run one of these problems. Okay, going on, um, the lookup part is you have to get this Z alpha over two. Okay, so um, let's draw a picture. And I want to remind you, it looks like it's sloping. So, oops. So I'll remind you um, that the right tail has area alpha over two. And that's what defines Z alpha over two. Okay. And the area to the left of that, this is a rule of complements thing, so it's one minus alpha over two. Okay, so you're gonna have to, oops, that should say Z alpha over two. It's such an obnoxious notation. Z with a subscript of alpha over two, like that. Okay, and then um, you have two ways to get this. Um, so we're looking up Z alpha over two. Um, so you can get Z alpha over two from table A1. And you're familiar with table A1? Um, but you, what you are doing is you're starting with an area and you have to find a z-score. And this is one of the tricks we learned um, when we we're studying this. You're looking for the area to the left, which is going to be approximately 1 minus alpha over 2. You just look for something in the table that's as close to that as possible. And you go out to the edges of the table to get your z-score. So the Z alpha over two will be here on the left. And if you remember, um, the top row of the table gives the hundredths place. So that's, that's how you can get that number. That's a little bit of a pain. Um, it's easier to use table A2, so that's a new one. And I'm not gonna go into all the details of table A2 because they involve things we haven't learned yet. There's one thing you need to know. All the z-scores are in the bottom row of the table. So um, you can get z alpha over two easier. Oops, so I can't spell it. from table A2 okay and so let me just show you how that works um, you don't have to find alpha oh no you have to, you do have to find alpha that's the only thing a little problem <laughs> okay There's a thing called degrees of freedom. I'm not going to go into detail yet. We, we actually have talked about degrees of freedom. It had to do with 
the number of deviations in a standard deviation that are random, those are called the degrees of freedom. And because the deviations always add up to zero, um, the last one isn't random. So if you have n as your sample size, then there are n deviations from the mean, but only n minus one of them are random. Um, so the degrees of freedom is n minus one, okay? But we're not gonna use that. We're gonna go further into the table where we go to the very bottom row where it says large, and in parentheses it says z. Now this means that when degrees of freedom gets large, whatever this is, in the bottom row with large degrees of freedom, the critical value is a z alpha over two score. So you wanna find your alpha on the top row, not alpha over two, just alpha. And it's gotta say two tails. Okay. And I would recommend you use this table because it's much quicker and it's more precise. Now it's two tails because you're cutting off, well, I don't have the picture there, but if you go back to this picture, you're cutting off two tails to find a lower bound and an upper bound in the distribution. So um, just make sure it says two tails under alpha, not one tail. And in the bottom row, you'll get the Z alpha over two value. Okay, again, this is in the bottom row. Um, just to let you know, if you stop at the wrong row, um, not the bottom row, but if you stop using the degrees of freedom here, these values are called T alpha over two. Okay. And I just wanna say, don't use this yet. <laughs> So the t-scores are for means, z-scores are for proportions, because proportions always have a normal distribution. When we move to means, generally we end up having to use the t-distribution. Okay. We'll do an example in just one sec. Okay, now the rest of this I think you already um, could come up with, remember the margin of error we did already. So the margin of error is E equals Z alpha over two from the bottom row of the table times the square root. Now the formula for the standard error says PQ over N. That's the formula. And unfortunately, um, you don't know those values. Remember, Going back up to the top, population proportion is P, and P is unknown because nobody surveys whole populations, but they sur survey samples. And the, the proportion from a sample is called P hat, and that's your best estimate for P. Q hat will be one minus P hat. Maybe I'll make that note here. Q hat is one minus P hat. And so it's a simple, uh, pretty simple computation, um, but you gotta use your square root function properly. So we'll practice that. And when we say the endpoints of the confidence interval, what we're saying is you're just taking your sample proportion plus or minus the margin of error. So um, P hat is the estimate. Okay, plus or minus the margin for error, E. I stopped saying margin of error because that people somehow think that's the error. Now I say margin for error, which I think gives the idea better. Okay, so this, when you do the adding and subtracting, P hat, 
minus the margin of error and p hat plus the margin of error. What you're doing is you're saying, I hope that the population proportion is within the margin of error of p. So that is to say that the population proportion would be between these limits. Okay, we're hoping that it's between the sample proportion minus your margin for error and the sample proportion plus your margin for error, and that's called a confidence interval. Okay, now people, I mean, if you if you watch and as you read, you know, articles, um, you'll see, especially in, in, when it comes to politics, but also in medical research and whatnot, you get percentages a lot. And the margins for error are percentage points. Uh, so normally they just report your margins for error. They don't give confidence intervals. Confidence intervals are a little more honest, I think, because it's just like it's a real, a real statement of uncertainty, which is the nature of statistics. So I, I kind of prefer that. Okay, so um, the interpretation basically, you're just hoping that your population proportion is in this interval, and you're not entirely sure that it is. Um, but we are 99% confident or 95% confident, if that's your level of confidence. So let me just show you here. Um, we'll say we, um, we are, um, you, you, we want to say how confident we are. Don't act like you're 100% confident. So I'm going to say we are blank percent confident. So that could be 99 or 95 or 94, or 93, whatever. Um, we are blank percent confident that uh, between, and this is just a suggested wording, um, blank percent, that'll be your lower limit. And um, the other percentage, which will be your upper limit. Um, of, so between blank and blank percent of, fill in the blank here, this will be some population, I'll just put in parentheses here. Um, our, um, successes in a binomial experiment. I won't say that. Um, so some category, it's categorical data. Okay, so the category could be approving of the president, um, whatever. So generally that's how we interpret these. We just give our level of confidence and we give the range of values. Okay, so we don't wanna act like we're 100% sure. Okay, any questions about this? All right, let's uh, see if we can get through a couple of examples before we uh, take our break and then start the quiz. Okay, so um, real quickly, it says 900 voters are randomly selected and 414 say they'll support the Democrat who's running for president. Hmm. Give a 95% confidence interval for the proportion of all voters who plan to run for the Democrat. Now we got 414 out of 900, but that's just a sample. You have to understand that statistic will contain some error. So um, the, uh, the N is the 900, okay? The X is the number of successes. Those are the 414 from our binomial experiment. You can do the P hat, um, P hat, is x over n, so that would be 414 out of 900. So let's see here. Okay, so that's 0.46, exactly. So I'm gonna write 0 0.460 just to kind of convey, I know the next digit, and I'm supposed to keep three digits for these. 
um, anything that starts with a P has three digits because it's a proportion or a percent or a probability. And when I say digit, three digits, I mean three significant digits. You will need a Q hat here. So that's one minus P hat. Okay, so that's the complement of 46%, which should be 54%, 0. 0.540. Okay. We have to check the successes and failures. So let's count successes real quick. This is 414, and that's the thing that has to be at least 10, which it is, and then also fails. They won't tell you the number of fails, but you just subtract. So there's 900 people minus the 414 successes. Okay, so that's 486 also greater than or equal to 10. So we're looking good. We're just going through these steps here. So I think I've done everything in step one. Oh, I have to get a level of confidence. So let's get that. Um, I'll just write conf. So our confidence level is um, 0.95. So that means that alpha is 1 minus 0.95, which is 0 Okay, so any questions so far? I gave myself very little space to work this problem. Now, um, let me double check. I think at the back of this handout, I'm gonna zip to the uh, last page real quick. So it's not the, well, I don't think you guys have this. That's funny. So the, the very um, last page is the one. This is table A2. Okay, and I was just saying use the bottom row of the table to get your z-scores. So way down at the bottom and where it says large z, these are the z-alpha over two values here. Okay. So what you want to do is find your alpha value and it's got to be two tailed because the confidence intervals have the lower and the upper tail. Um, when you cut off that middle 95% anyway, not, and I think our alpha was 0.05. And so you have to do that under two tail here. So it's just a 0.05 alpha and then you go to the bottom row. Okay, so it's really straightforward. But it's all the way down to here like that. And I'll draw that on the diagram. Bottom row, 1.96, as long as you're looking up a 0.05 two tail. Okay, is there any question about this? This isn't going to be on today's test, is it? No, no, no. No, the, the test is only on um, chapter five and six. Okay. And uh, yeah, no, I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> okay, so um, let me just draw, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I need to head back to my notes here. Okay, so um, table A2. That first column, DF, just ignore it. Go to the bottom row where it says large. Z, um, that's large degrees of freedom where you get Z scores. And then our alpha is 0.05. And 
make sure you pick two tail and bottom row. It said 1.960, I think. So that's your Z alpha over two. Easiest way to get it. it requires the least amount of fuss. Okay, any questions? All right, so um, not much space left, but all we have to do is margin of error now and the confidence interval and the interpretation. So I think we can squeeze that all in here. So let's go to the margin of error, which is Z alpha over two, square root, P hat, Q hat over N. All right, so the Z alpha over two is 1.96. Um, square root p hat, I don't need to write the zero down here, 0.46 times 0.54, and then over that sample size, which was 900. All right, any questions? So um, I'm gonna show this on a calculator. Um, you should try to do this all in one um, computation because it, it will reduce your error in the margin for error. We don't wanna have a lot of error here. So best if you just type the whole thing in. So I'm gonna switch over to my camera real quick and see if this will work. Okay, and then um, this is 1.96, and then the square root is to the left of the seven, but you have to do second because it's above the key. So second, then the square root, and then the fraction inside, do a little fraction with the fraction button, which is above the seven. Okay. And then I think it was 0.46 times 0.54 over 900. So this will give you the least amount of rounding error if you just do it all in one computation, like that. Okay, so hit enter at 0.0325 or six, I guess, 0.0326. Okay, any questions about the computation? So it should be 0 0.0326. Okay, and then the rest is pretty easy. You have to do p hat um, plus or minus the error. So um, this is taking your error into account. So this is a 3.3 .3 really percentage point error. And so usually these come out with about three percentage point error, especially if your sample size is around a thousand. If it goes down, then the error can shoot way up. So p hat was 0.46 minus the error 0.0326. And then 0.46 plus 0.0326. I'm going to go ahead and put that um, trailing zero back in on the 0.46 so that you can see that I'm keeping three significant figures in every one of these proportions. Okay. I will round again after this computation.
Okay, so if I get 0.4274, I'm just going to round this to 0.427, three significant figures. And that's the lower limit, and then the upper limit, you add. And again, I'll round this to three significant figures, 493. So there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, 0.427 and 0.493 are our limits. Um, so we, we, we think that the Democrat is gonna get less than 50% of the vote for sure. And most 49.3%, how sure? 95% confident. Okay. So we, we write it this way that the, your P is between these values, it's between P hat minus your error and p hat um, plus the error. So the population proportion is just everybody that's gonna vote for this person. That proportion should be between 0.427 and 0.493. Okay, and then your conclusion is what I described before. We are blank percent confident that between blank percent and blank percent of something is something else. Okay, so we are, this one we did 95% confidence. So we are 95% confident um, that between 42.7% um, and 49.3% of voters um, are voting for the Democrat. Okay, so we'll not get a majority, at least based on this research. Okay, 95% confident. It all depends on random sampling. If your sample is not random or representative, then it, this doesn't mean a thing. Um, so Jay Zarcos, the three sig figs always, yeah, that's our rule. Um, on the exam, I'm being very explicit on every problem. Just on the exam, um, just round according to what it says. Okay, just, just read it carefully. Make sure you see the rounding on this. Um, on the uh, normal probabilities, I said four. I want to make sure everybody's doing exactly the same thing. Okay. So the rule was three sig figs, but on the normal, I had you do four. Okay, so we've got another confidence interval that we want to do. Um, this one says in a Gallup survey of 1,100 registered Republicans, uh, this is a real survey from a few years back. 175 state that climate, climate change will affect their lives. Give a 98% confidence interval for the proportion of Republicans who believe that climate change will affect their lives. Okay, so again, I'm just going to pop through these steps here. Uh, the first step was the gathering and checking. So we need to get that p hat value. Um, we're going to need a level of confidence uh, and alpha. Um, and we'll need to um, do our check that n times p hat, which is the number of successes, n times q hat, the number of fails, both of those can be the same. So we'll go ahead and, and run through all of this. OK, so let's just go ahead and do the p hat value first. Um, so. Uh, 175 is X, that's the number of successes. Um, the sample size is 1100, so that's N. P hat is X over N. So here we're doing 175 over 1100. Now let's see what that is. And um, sounds like we've got 0.159 for that. That's almost 16%. Okay. 
Um, we may as well do the Q hat value. Um, Q hat is one minus P hat. So one minus that last one, which is just like 0 0.841. We'll need that. Um, we've got our M. Confidence level is 98%, which is a weird one. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to do a check. So, and, and we may as well do alpha before we do that. So alpha the number is one minus the confidence level. So 100% minus 98% is 2%, which is 0.02. Okay, and then we can put our check in. In the uh, number of successes has to be bigger than 10 and the number of failures. So successes um, were 175. Of course, that's greater than or equal to 10. Okay, and then also the same for the number of fails. And then, of course, here you have to subtract. So it's 1,100 minus 175. Um, just take the sample size and subtract the successes. So it's 925 failures. These are our estimates for the length of the left tail and the right tail of the binomial distribution that's associated that underlies um, this binomial experiment. If the tails are longer than 10, then we can use the normal distribution to do the probabilities, and that's a little bit easier than the binomial. Okay, so now um, we have to look up the Z critical value just to remind you what happens once we, once we do our check. We're looking up this Z alpha over 2 value. And um, it's easiest if you do that from table A2. Okay. Um, you just, instead of using degrees of freedom in that table, you go to the bottom row of the table under your alpha value where it says two tails, the Z alpha over two is there. So it's pretty easy to use. Um, there's something here about don't use this uh, T alpha over two, just the Z alpha over two. You'll see the T alpha over two is today later. Okay, so just real quick, uh, I'm gonna make a note here for our Z alpha over two. Maybe a little picture of the table. So there's a degree of freedom column. We go to the bottom row where it just says large down there. Those are Z scores. Okay. Find our alpha. The alpha is 0.02, and this is two tailed. Two tailed just means um, we're dividing the alpha between our two tails. And if you look at the picture we drew back here, um, the tails, even better, the previous page here, the tails are both alpha over two. So we're splitting the alpha among the two tails here. Okay, so find it alpha point of two, two tail, and like this. Okay. Now, um, and again, let me make a note here, this is table A2. Okay, so Somewhere in this handout, I've got a table A2. Let's see if I can find it. Um, quick here. And I'm not finding it that way, so I'm going to have to do it the hard way. All right, here's table A2. Let me clean it up a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so just remember, um, you look under two tails, our alpha again is 0.02, so that's right here. And you just go to the bottom row, okay? All the way down to whatever value is down there. Uh, it looks like 2.326. That's our Z alpha over two. So super easy, you just find your alpha and you go to the bottom row. Any questions about that? Okay, so I think it's a 2.326. Again, it's always about two standard errors. Depends on the level of confidence. This one is allowing, uh, wants to be 98% confident. 
And the more confident you have to be or you want to be, the more margin you have to allow for error as this makes the margin of error bigger. Okay, and speaking of the margin of error, we can do that next. So if you go back up here, this is the formula uh, for the margin of error that I'm wiggling around. Ooh. And um, so I'm going to grab that and paste it down below. Okay, so that's what we have to compute. Uh, we've got all these numbers. So the Z critical value um, was 2.336. So we're doing about two standard errors, 2.326 to be precise. And if you have um, 0.159, times the Q hat, which is 0.841. And then you divide by that sample size, which is 1100. Okay. All right, so run those. Let's see if we can get three places after the decimal on this, you guys. And if somebody would just put that down with, uh, technically the rule is three significant figures, but um, in the end, we're gonna round the three figures anyway. So uh, anybody that's got it? 0 0.0256, thanks Matthew. 0 0.0256 is what I got also. So now the confidence interval Um, that's just a uh, p hat minus the margin of error. Hopefully is less than the population proportion, which is less than p hat plus the margin of error. You're just saying the population proportion is within the margin of error of the sample proportion, is what that says. So for p hat minus e, um, you're gonna do the um, 0.159 and then subtract the 0.0256. I'll round this again to three figures. So that's 0.133. And then for P hat plus E, um, so we put that up. And again, we'll just do three figures as usual. <laughs> Thank you. 0.185 is correct. <clears throat> so um, your population proportion is unknown, but we're hoping it's between 0.133 and 0.185. Again, that's 13.3% and 18.5%. Whenever you work with categorical data, you summarize those with um, with uh, uh, percentages or sample proportions, and uh, whenever you work with percentages and proportions, this is how you compute your margin of error. Okay, simple enough. Okay, is there any questions? Remember, you're working with you're you're making estimates about population data. So nobody really wants to know about your sample. They want to know about population. So you have to give that margin of error. All right, and then um, just to kind of go back to the page, we had said uh, you, you should make a conclusion that's something like we're blank percent confident that between 1% and another percent of some population are in some category. So here we're talking about Republicans who 
believe that climate change will affect their lives. So um, we are, what is it, 98% confident? Um, that between um, 13.3 and 18.5% of Republicans believe uh, that climate change would affect, affect their lives. Okay, that's it. So that's easy. Um, I always write a lot when you do when I do this with it. There's really very little work. I, yeah, I can squeeze this in with just a quick um, couple of notes. Um, the checks are important, so don't forget to do those. Okay, any questions? Okay, um, now there's a, there's a bit down here under managing error. And remember, we've got this thing called the margin for error and, and um, it's related to the sample size. So if I was to paste that formula down here, I could solve it for the sample size. And the idea is right now we're viewing the sample size as sort of the independent variable you can pick any sample size you want. And then the margin of error is a dependent variable. You don't get to pick the margin of error. It's determined by these other variables. Um, and, and, but what if you wanted to make the sample size um, the dependent variable, then you could make the margin of error an independent variable, which means you could pick the margin of error. And um, so you just, you just got to solve the equation for the sample size. So let's start by squaring both sides. Um, so we'd get e squared equals this z um, alpha over 2. That's going to get squared. And then you're going to have this p hat, uh, q hat. And I think I'll just make one fraction here and just say the whole thing over n. Okay, so that's going to make it easy to solve for n. So this, let's just put our notes in here. So we're going to multiply both sides by n. Like that. And of course, it'll cancel on the right. Um, I want to get rid of the e squared. So let's divide by e squared on both sides. Okay, so on the left, then the e square will cancel. And that's solved for the sample size. Okay, this is, I would call this a minimum sample size. Um, for a, um, let's say a chosen margin of error. And so the minimum means no smaller than, so you see you'd have this n equals the z alpha over two squared, and then there's a p hat, a q hat, and then over and it looks like the margin of error squared. Okay, that's kind of cool. So 
but you get to pick your margin of error. Um, this is a little bit weird because it assumes that you've computed p hat and a q hat. And if you, <laughs> if you go back, uh, just a reminder up here, um, whoa, whoa, did not mean to do that. Um, p hat is x over n. So wait a minute, you need to have a sample size to do p hat. <laughs> All right, so. The, the, the philosophy here is you're going to have to do gather at least a little bit of data so you'll have a sense of what the sample proportion is going to come out as. Um, but what if you don't want to? What if you don't want to go out and do preliminary data so you can get a p hat for this formula? Here's a little um, a kind of a doodle that I'm going to do on the right of this mess. I'm going to kind of squeeze things together a little better here. So, um, and I'll put this under possible p hat values. So, I'm going to make a little table over here. Okay, and I'm going to show you how the p hats, the q hats, and then the p hat q hats <laughs> can play out. And I'm not going to do every value of p hat, but I'll go up in um, 0.1 increments. So you could go um, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on. I'm gonna go all the way up to 0.9. Okay, and remember, um, Q hat is a complement of P hat. They have to add up to one. So if P hat is 0.1, then Q hat has to be 0.9, it just has to be. Um, I'm going to straighten this out a little bit because it's getting in my way. There we go. All right, so then um, again, they're complements of so 0.2 and 0 0.8, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and so on. Okay. So those are possible values of q hat that go with the p hat value. And what I'm more interested in is p hat times q hat because that comes up in the formula p hat times q. <laughs> I'm going to do that. So p hat times q hat is in the formula here. And um, so, you know, the idea is, well, what are the possible values for that? Um, if I don't know what p hat is, then let's look at hypotheticals here. So we're just doing p hat q hat. So if you do one times nine, that's nine, but there's two places after the decimal. So this is gonna be 0 0.09. Two times eight is 16, again, with two places after 0 0.16. Three times seven, 21. Four times six is 24. Five times five is 25. Six times four is 24. Notice it starts going to the end. Seven times three is 21. Eight times two is 16. And nine times one is nine. So the idea is that you know of all the different values you can get um, for p hat and q hat, um, the biggest that the product between them can be is 0.25. Okay. So keep that in mind um, as I write the following. So. Um, if you want a sample size corresponding to a chosen margin of error, you are picking your margin for error. Um, this will give you a sample size. So um, I'll let's just say sample um, at least this many. What we came up with at first, which was um, n uh, equals z alpha over two squared and then you've got the p hat q hat and then it's over the margin of error squared okay and here we would have to say that p hat would be provided through a pilot study pilot study is just kind of an initial study So someone does a little study 
and then you get your p hat. And of course, um, q hat is one minus p hat. Okay, so that's one way to get a sample size. You have to go out and do a pilot study, and then you'll know how much bigger you have to expand your study. Um, but what if you don't have, you don't want to do that? So then you would sample at least. this many, um, n equals uh, z alpha over two squared. Now, again, there's a p hat, q hat, but the biggest that that can be is 0.25. So let's just put in times 0 0.25. I have made this as big as it can be, maybe bigger than it needs to be. That's sort of a drawback. Um, you're sort of going to the extreme when you do this. Uh, still dividing by your chosen margin of error squared. Okay, let's do a, a quick little example, but I should mention these should be rounded up because of the words at least. I don't make a big fuss about that. Um, but technically we make this larger. That beast means no smaller than this. Okay, so it says in the previous example, what sample size is needed to give a maximum error of two percentage points and 98% confidence? I have to go back and look at that problem. Um, so we had done 98% confidence. So that means we're going to continue to use um, the 2.326. But notice that I had a margin of error of 0.0256, which is actually larger than I want. Okay, I this thing says I want a two percentage point margin of error. Okay, so let's just run the formula here. And I do have a p hat and a q hat because we just kind of view this original problem here as a pilot study. Somebody's already gone out. Uh, and got us a p hat, 0.159. So let's go ahead and run this. Um, sample size should be um, z alpha over two squared. Put in the p hat, the q hat, oops. And then you just divide it by your margin of error that you've chosen squared. So the z alpha over two, we're still at 98% confidence, as I said. So with 98% confidence, um, your alpha would still be 0.02, so you'd still be using the 2.326 for z alpha over 2. We we'll just reuse that 2.326, but it gets squared. Okay, now the, again, the p hat value uh, was what? 0.159, and q hat 0.841. So times 0 0.15. 0.59 times 0 0.841. And then your margin of error was two percentage points. So it needs two. These are percentage points. So you have to use 0.02. Okay, and then square that. All right. So we're going to run that formula. I'd use the fraction button. Uh, let me just, I'm going to try and show this. That makes it hard because I don't know if I'm going to do anymore. <laughs> but you guys will help me. Okay, so with the fraction button, I think it was 2.326 squared. Now was it 0.159? Yes. So we say times 0.159 and then times 0.841. Okay. Margin of error was 2 percentage points, which is 0.02. Don't forget to square that. Lots of times people forget to square it. So this is a bigger sample. Now we're up to over 1,800, where we were at 1,100. So if you think about it, we had a two point something percentage point error. If you want to bring it down to a flat two percentage points, then you need 1,800 and I'm going to say nine people in the study. And that's, that's pretty tough. 
Um, so again, it's um, 1808.6. Which always we've been around this up to the next number up, so 1809, because they say no less than this amount. So we're gonna have to make it bigger. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, it's, it's, it, we want it to be a whole number because this is how many people are in a sample and how many individuals. Does that make sense? Uh, why did we use the 0 0.5, 0 0.5 out, um, why out of all of them on the table? Oh, I was trying to figure out what the biggest my sample size could be. So the formula started with this um, started with this p hat q hat in it. Then that was just solving for the sample size. So you got to have the p hat times the q hat in there. But what if you don't have them? Was the idea. And and remember, you're trying to increase your sample size. So how big should it be? Is the question to get your margin of error down to a certain level. So. Um, if you're trying to increase your sample size, but you don't have a p hat and a q hat, this this statement over here is just to say, well, if the if you don't know what p hat and q hat are, it's okay for p hat q hat. Just put in a 0.25 because you know it's going to be less than that. Now, this is going to make your sample bigger by putting in the biggest possible value here, but that's a good thing. Bigger means smaller errors. So this is telling you, okay, don't, you don't need to go any bigger than this, basically. Um, if you put the 0.25 in there, you'll get this, this number out of the formula that's kind of guaranteeing that your margin of error will be within whatever you're requiring of it. Does that make sense, Matthew? Okay. All right, any questions? Okay, so we're just pumping up our sample size, trying to get that margin of error down. Um, it's kind of a clever trick. At least it's, it's not perfect, but it gives you a sense of, you know, okay, 1800, great, you know, I'll go out and do that. 1100 was not enough, apparently. Okay. Remember, we're just trying to get errors down. That's, that's really all that's happening here. 